right. I call this the good, the bad, and the scary. Um, and I intend it to be maybe two weeks, and, and I think it can go further if it really gets uh, intense and people want to talk about it a lot more. But um, I want to kind of go at it a little bit different way than most of the things I've seen. And I first I want to start imagining that this will work. <laughs> Imagine a, a world in which maybe food scientists develop a strain of barley that resists any kind of uh, uh, fungus growth and so on, and, and barley yields increase by a great percentage. Or imagine a world in which tomatoes can sit in the pantry for months without rotting. Crops that can better withstand all the challenges from climate change. Mosquitoes that are unable to transmit malaria or a bunch of other diseases. Zika and uh, West Nile, all the other ones. Ultramuscular cattle that can uh, give you maybe 40, 50 percent more beef from the same amount of food supplied to them. Cows that no longer grow horns, they usually have to dehorn them in a very painful process because the horns can be dangerous to the handlers, the farmers, or also to other cows. Okay. So now they're dehorning them typically by burning them off, very painful process. But you could do something in which these cattle could now be dehorned, be born with uh, no capacity to grow these horns. Actually, really, all these far-fetched ideas are actually happening right now. Actual creatures, animals, crops, things that have all these capacities. Within the next few years, new biotechnologies are going to come along and give us much high, higher yielding crops healthier livestock, and much more nutritious food. It sounds like a pretty good prescription. Beyond that, in a few decades maybe, we might well have genetically engineered pigs that can serve as human organ donors. But we could also have woolly mammoths returning. We could also have winged lizards crafted by ourselves, and even human-crafted unicorns if we choose. Imagine what Disney could do with this. <laughs> so I'm not kidding, all that stuff is definitely possible within the next few decades. Designer pigs the size of small dogs are actually now being crafted, in which uh, maybe rich people that really want to have a new, the newest technique and proper size animal that can fit into their household be made. So how are these changes and the adaptations coming about? It's a CRISPR-Cas9, and you should know about it. A few other beneficial results of this. Rice strains whose DNA was edited to, to protect against bacterial blight. Corn, soybeans, and potatoes can be edited to confer natural um, resistance to herbicides. <coughs> Mushrooms could be impervious to browning and spoiling. At present, the U.S. citrus industry is threatened heavily down in Florida by a bacterial plant disease, and actually they, they could be saved. The famous Cavendish banana is susceptible to a devastating soil fungus, and that is almost certainly treatable with this technique as well, too. So not only crops, though, agribusiness is very interested in means to enhance livestock in many different ways. So I bring all this up as an intro to CRISPR, this new technology, a new technique developed just in the last decade. I wanted you to have some of that kind of back sitting, sitting in your mind as we start talking about the history of it, too, and how it's come about to be, and get into some of the, some of the uh, challenges of it having CRISPR as well. Okay. 
How many people here have, have heard of CRISPR? It's a very large number. We talked about CRISPR slightly when we were talking about mosquitoes earlier in the fall and how, how we could potentially, that's the first I really, I think, heard about CRISPR, talking about how it could make mosquitoes uh, unable to mate and pass on genes or unable to carry malaria and so on too. So to get to understand CRISPR, I think we have to go back in, uh, in history quite a while. I know I talked about years ago that if you talk about the human span, the span of an arm from here to here is talking about representing the life on Earth, right? About 4,000 million years, 4 billion years as we say in the U.S. Uh, four and a half billion years is the life of our solar system, but four billion years is here. If I move over to the, way over to that side of the building, about the whole life since the Big Bang would be about the width and scale, the width of this, uh, of the time since the Big Bang to now. But this is the portion we're talking about, life on Earth, four billion years. So for you, you think life started about here for all this time, all the way over to this point, the most complex creature on Earth, the most complex organism, let's call it, was bacteria, right? Bacteria up to this time, and then we go on, somewhere around here was a Cambrian explosion, where we finally get multicellular animals that do some amazing things, develop eyes and predation techniques and so on. The dinosaurs aren't till about in here somewhere, right? The death of the dinosaurs about your last knuckle joint, the growth of mammals and so on comes way out of the fingertip. And if you think of human recorded history, or well, humanity on, on Earth, 200,000 years, you could take it off with a fingernail clipper. Right? And recorded history, all the stories of, of uh, Julius Caesar and the Babylonians and everything up till now, you could take off with one swipe with a file. So that's something you have to think about in terms of the whole history of life on Earth and humanity's time on it. So CRISPR is something that developed way much earlier than any humans did. Right? CRISPR is an initial beginning of developments of ways for bacteria to combat um, viral, viral uh, in, infusions. <coughs> so bacteria have been on the planet for around 4,000 million years. They've been in a competition of sorts with each other almost all of that time. They've also been instrumental for the, this other early traveler, entities that have been here just as long as bacteria. To both of them, we would seem like fresh arrivals, maybe fresh meat or something for them on a common journey. But both have energetically incorporated us and similar beings into their web of life. And so that's viruses. So CRISPR is this development from the interaction between bacteria and viruses. So let me let me start talking a little bit about viruses and see what uh, how much of this is common to you. These are bacteria. You know what the backside is a flagellum, a little tail that can maneuver it around. Some bacteria have uh, a nucleus with cells, this one doesn't. And those black lines in there are the chromosomes that carry all the genetic structure that's the whole genome we'll be talking about of, of a living thing. So these have the capacity to split and reproduce and so on, and they're definitely considered alive. Bacteria. This is a typical virus, also called a phage, a bacterial phage. A virus is a microscopic parasite which can infect living organisms, often causing disease. Viruses consist of a, a, nucleic, a, a, um, a nucleic acid, which is RNA or DNA, and a protein coat that just protects it. They reproduce by getting their nucleic acid strand into a cell of some other organism. Okay. That RNA and DNA takes over the cell machinery to reproduce copies of itself and the protein coat. The cell then bursts open and sends more virus or bacteria phages out into the world, another infection. So 
So this is somewhat showing its anatomy. Up here is the DNA in its head. And this is not, they've taken electron microscope pictures of, of uh, bacteria, and they can be a whole variety of different things, but this is not uncommon. It looks like a spaceship, but it's very common. It has these legs on it, has a body to it, and has this uh, head with DNA on it. So this is not just some kind of manufactured representation. So it can land on a bacterium. You can see the cell of the bacterium. And it can insert its DNA into here. You can see the DNA trailing out here. It has a, usually some kind of deposit structure that can penetrate the wall of the bacteria and deposit its DNA in there. Okay. And that DNA can then start creating parts of the, of the virus, parts of that phage. And then as it grows and makes a bunch of more little viruses like itself, then they some get so big that they blast out of the cell. They, they destroy the cell. Pretty effective for a small creature, right, to just have DNA and this capacity to infect a living cell and take over the machinery of that cell. So with no humans or vertebrae or animals or even any multicelled organisms, bacteria and viruses have danced this dance for a very long, very long time. Viruses need a host to reproduce. For billions of years, the only available hosts were bacteria and another single group, single cell group called archaea. Bacteriophages or viruses are highly specialized and generally only attack one type of bacteria. So this is a virus that's evolved and developed to attack this bacteria. It won't attack, it won't attack other bacteria. And this bacteria now is being threatened, and many bacteria die. They're, they're taken over, and they die and explode, making the new viruses. But some of them survive, right? Some of them are able to live through it. If you, if you look down at your left hand right now, there are more than 10 billion phages on, on <coughs> Earth right now. 10 billion more on your right hand. Imagine that. Right? Each of us here. Start doing the math, it starts getting pretty incredible. So what are they doing there? Why are phages on your hands? What's that? Hanging around, looking cool. Hanging around, looking cool? They're, they're there already. Phages can last in ice, they can last in very hot places, they can last, they're all designed to, to survive in very tough environments, they can survive out in space, right? They can, they don't really have a respiration cycle or an eating cycle or anything like that. So they can live until they come in contact with something that they can use as a host structure, right? So they're hanging around waiting for the right kind of bacteria to land near them that they can attack and start developing their life cycle going. Okay. So your hand is a hotbed of bacterial activity, just for reasons that I don't even want to go with. But uh, that, that makes it an ideal hunting ground for phages. So here's bacterial phages attached to a bacterial cell. These have been able to be photographed with electron microscopy, so very high magnification, but you can see a whole host of bacterial phages trying to work their way into this cell. And almost every time, maybe 99% of the bacterial, the bacterial phages attack the bacterial cell. They hijack it, they change its uh, they add their DNA and it changes the structure of the cell and the cell is being used now not to do what it was intended to do but to make more viruses. Okay. But then certain bacteria have evolved a way to fight against it because there's four billion years of time to work with, right? And they can't just sit there and, and, and accept this. So this is something we'll return to a little bit. I just want to look at part of it right now. But you can see a cell membrane of a, ba of a bacteria here. You can see a, a phage has landed on it and is 
depositing its viral DNA to take over the cell, right? Okay. So what bacteria have been able to do have, has been, with, with the developments of evolution of things, they're able to actually send out proteins whose jobs are to detect viral DNA or DNA that's not, not important to the cell itself, and they chop it up. There's actually little chopping, physical chopping in pigs. So, so the early bacteria were able to just sit there and chop up this bacteria and make, make it inactive, right? Now maybe they can't get it all, and many, many bacteria couldn't do it, and the virus was so strong that it took it over and died, but enough of these were able to do it that it survived, that, that this bacteria survived. And by evolution, those types of bacteria then had this strength in them, this capacity to chew up this bacteria or this viral DNA and put it and, and, and stop this viral infection. Okay. You know, we, we can get a viral infection and then we survive it and so on, and then we have what we call antibodies against it sometimes and so on, but uh, this was similar to an immunization technique. The second thing that they're able to do is that they took some of these chopped up parts and they incorporated it into their own genome. It's almost the most uh, evolutionary part of the gene. We talk about genes being um, able to evolve and adapt and mutate and so on. And this is a case where they were able to, these small one cell bacteria, oops, were able to take a portion of what they had destroyed and incorporate it into their genome so that now another time comes by and if this, if this bacterium has survived the first infection, when another one comes along, it has what you might call mugshots of the, uh, of the original viral bacteria. And what that allows it to do, it allows it to more quickly identify the bacteria before the viral, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it can identify the viral um, DNA more quickly as soon as it's injected into the cell. It can compare it with the mugshots of what it sees and then, uh, and then uh, have another attack at trying to get rid of it. Okay. Anybody know who those mugshots are? What's that? Ah, it looks like Bonnie and Clyde. A little bit more current. This is the, one of the guys that got out of, uh, of um, uh, Alcatraz. John Anglin. And this is Patty Hurst. I'm not suggesting she's a virus. <laughs> okay. So. Let me get back. So to keep their uh, genetic memory palace, you could almost call it, in order, they spaced out each bit of viral code with a spacer there. So there's a viral code for, for, uh, for this virus here, and they space it out with things that are uh, palindromic repeats, which is how you start getting the CRISPR name. Okay, so there's a palindromic repeat, then there's this what used to be called a spacer before they understood what it was, another palindromic repeat, a spacer, and this is their memory palace to keep track of any infections that they've had, any infestations by a virus, and they're able to then take this, put it into another type of protein, and then use it to target another infection when it comes along. Pretty amazing, a single cell bacteria able to do that, right? Okay. So, we move on. So here's another, maybe another way to look at it. I kind of have some repeats here because sometimes these pictures can be a little complicated. But this is the CRISPR array over here on this side, and these you can think of as different genomes from different viral attacks. And these are these palindromic spacers. What it means in a palindrome is something like noon or 
mom, word that reads the same backwards and forwards. So the code of the of the um, base pairs in the gene is the same backwards and forwards. We're not even really sure why that is, but these are these are oops, these are the things that they were looking at more um, as as an interesting thing. Why it got the name palindromic, but in these middle interspacing things are the are the real genomes of different viruses. Okay. Then there's these are genes that are near these all the time, and these are kept right on the genome. This this genome of bacteria evolves very quickly, and this is maybe the fastest evolving part of the genome of a bacteria because whenever it's attacked by a virus, it can add on more more um, arrays of different viruses that have attacked it. And over on this portion, these are uh, CRISPR-associated genes. And these are the genes that we'll talk about a bit further, too, and what they do, how they work with the, um, with the CRISPR array over here. Okay. So this is just kind of a look back to give you a chance to look back and see if that is being logical to you. This is the first infestation, the first viral attack. And then there are some Cas-associated genes that just their job is just to chew this stuff up as much as they can and inactivate the viral cell. And then they also collect this part of the genome and put it in this whole array here. They can transcribe and use these to, to make uh, warriors that fight back against new ones that come on again, associating with different Cas genes that are in some bacteria. <laughs> and go again to fight any new viral infection that comes in. <laughs> you must have a viral attack going on the brain. <laughs> okay. Or the mold or the bacteria or the whatever. Having these guide DNA fragments on file meant that the next time the virus returned, the bacteria could send out a more powerful weapon. They could equip a lumpy, clam-shaped protein that is specially capable of cutting up DNA with a copy of that guide DNA. Like a molecular assassin, it would go and snip any viral code that matched the genetic mugshot. So again, another way to look at it, this is the acquisition, the first stage. Some of these that have been given names, a Cas1 and Cas2, these were the original ones in, in some cells. They can actually snip out a part of that genome, add it in to the DNA, and it goes in, in, in spacers, what they called them the spacers originally. And then they have, you can see maybe three different colors, a light yellow, a light green, and a darker green. So this one has uh, the genome of three different viral attacks in its bacterial chromosome. Okay. So now, later on, conferring immunity, if this virus comes on, it's similar to this phage over here, and puts in its DNA into the cell, this cell now has the capacity to kind of run through its mugshot file or its, or its uh, palace of memories and find out which is the common structure that, that matches up with this DNA. So this is darker green, and this is darker green. So it selects the proper portion, and it binds in there. This is actually a length, 20 to 40 base pairs of, uh, of um, um, DNA long, the A's and G's and T's and so on. And it, it actually is able to sit there and travel around the cell, and it goes somewhere like 6 million 
strands of DNA a second, it can travel through here and pick off and find a matching, the matching genome. So it can travel through this whole genome and it can check this thing. This genome now is traveling through this sequence area here and it finds a matching portion of the DNA and that tells the protein to, to cleave it and it'll cut it across both lengths of the double helix of the DNA, making it inactive, stopping the activity of the gene. Pretty powerful stuff, pretty amazing. So that's what's happened in the wild for billions of years. But now in the lab, scientists have harnessed this CRISPR system to do more than fight off a viral infection. So the first thing that they want to do is they're not trying to fight off viral infections, they're trying to find something in our genome that is not proper, right? That they don't like there, the, the, the genome that maybe causes people to have sickle cell anemia or cystic <laughs> fibrosis or something like that, right? So they want to have something that can search through this whole genome of a person, right? All the different chromosomes, right? Uh, check every chromosome and look for <laughs> a defect, take that snip right at that particular point, and when they can snip at that particular point, you can either let the cell naturally uh, fix this to get rid of that if you want to deactivate a gene that maybe causes too much protein of some kind to be put into your body that causes over overproduction of a protein that causes some brain diseases and so on. Or even further, they can also insert a genome of proper uh, structure that, that will cause this uh, sickle cell anemia or anything else like that to be, uh, to be found and re uh, replaced, cut out the bad one and replace it with what you want. So it's a pretty powerful structure. So the first step is designing a guide, a guide DNA that can snip out a particular block of code in a living cell say a genetic defect or an undesirable trait in a crop plant, this block of code, usually around 20 base pairs long, can be injected into the cell they are trying to edit. Along with it goes the protein-based assassin I mentioned earlier, which is called Cas9. So once in the cell, once in the cell's nucleus, the CRISPR-Cas9 complex bumps along the length of genome in the cell there might be 60 million individual base pairs and the CRISPR complex searches like a word editing. It's, it's, it's essentially, you can really think of it like a word editing machine. It looks for this pair of, of uh, 20 pairs that matches up with it. It's like a find and replace kind of feature. And so it looks for a matching set of base pairs. If every base pair from the guide DNA matches up with its uh, complementary base pair in the host DNA, the guide DNA triggers this Cas9 to produce two pincher-like appendages, which actually cut the DNA in two. So I thought a few videos, I can talk and talk, and you know, I'm sure that some of it is uh, probably prob a problem for you, but I wanted to show a few videos that have maybe a produced kind of thing with the uh, graphics and so on that can help show it. So Scott's going to set up the Bozeman, uh, Bozeman University, University of Montana, I think, at Bozeman. I keep hearing that CRISPR is going to revolutionize medicine, the way we fight disease, cure cancer, and maybe even create new humans, and I agree with that. But I haven't been able to find great videos out there that explain what CRISPR is. They tend to be too complex or too simple. So I thought I'd throw another video into the mix. I'd probably present... Like most things in molecular biology, CRISPR was first identified in E. coli. And if we break apart the acronym, it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Now that's a mouthful, but it does tell you the two main parts found in CRISPR. First of all, we have the repeats. These are going to be short segments of DNA, so 20 to 40 letters in length, and they're going to be palindromes. Remember, a palindrome is a sequence of letters that read the same left to right, like never, odd, or even. So we're going to have these letters that are palindrome. The reason why is that when you transcribe that DNA, you make RNA that forms these little hairpin turns. So we've got the repeats. Those are all identical. 
one after another after another after another, but they're interspaced. And so what's in the middle, we're going to have what's called spacer DNA. Now what's interesting about the spacer DNA is that it's not identical. Each segment of spacer DNA is going to be unique. And this puzzled scientists when they identified this back in the 80s and 90s. But in the 2000s what they found is that that spacer DNA, that's the important DNA, matches up perfectly with viral, especially bacteriophage DNA. They also identified a number of genes associated with CRISPR. So these are the CRISPR-associated or Cas genes. Now those Cas genes will make Cas proteins. The Cas proteins in general are going to be helicases. Those are proteins that unwind DNA. And then nucleases, those that cut the DNA. And so the idea was, perhaps this is an immune system for bacteria, a way they could fight their old nemesis, the bacteriophage, and that's exactly what's going on. So if we have a picture of E. coli, this would be the cell membrane, cell wall right here. This would be the genome of the bacteria. I'm, I'm highlighting the Cas and the CRISPR system. And so when the bacteriophage injects its DNA, what normally would happen if you don't have an immune system, is this DNA would hijack the cell, it could become embedded in the genome, but more importantly it would make a bunch of these bacteriophages and eventually kill the cell. But since it has this CRISPR system, what it's going to do is it's going to transcribe and translate proteins, so this Cas complex, and it's also going to transcribe that DNA to make what's called CRISPR RNA, and it'll fit right into this protein like this. What is this? It's a way to fight that viral DNA. It essentially breaks it apart. And so before the infection starts, the infection essentially has ended. Now you might say that's interesting, but what happens if it's injecting DNA where we don't have a spacer that matches? Well, the CRISPR-Cas system works there as well. It's going to create a different class of protein, a class 1 Cas protein. And what that'll do is it takes the DNA in, it breaks it apart, but more importantly, it takes that DNA and copies it into the CRISPR system. So what is CRISPR? It is spacer, repeat, spacer, repeat, but the spacers are essentially history of old infections so we won't be infected again. This is exactly the way your immune system works on a much larger level. You're making antibodies and then you have white blood cells that'll envelop that invader. But what scientists thought is if we could hijack this CRISPR system, we could perhaps use it, because this is a living cell here, to either inactivate genes or maybe even embed new genes. And so the search was on. And the one that you'll hear most about is the CRISPR-Cas9 system. This was identified in the labs of Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. And what she was working on was Streptococcus pyogenes and their Cas uh, CRISPR system. And what's interesting about it is that they only had one Cas protein. We call that Cas9. Now it doesn't look like this, it looks like this, but if we look at its major structure, it has a nuclease. So it's got this section right here where it can cut DNA here, and it can cut DNA here as well. In S. pyogenes, they also are creating two long strips of RNA. We have the CRISPR RNA, CRISPR RNA is going to fit into the Cas, but they also have what's called tracer RNA. So if we look at what that looks like in this bacteria, you've got the spacer segment, that's going to be the part that matches up with the corresponding uh, viral DNA. You have this tracer RNA that essentially holds the CRISPR RNA in place. And then this whole thing together forms this complex where we can break DNA. But what the lab thought is, wouldn't it be cool if we could modify this whole system? Use the one Cas9 protein, but let's put our own sequence of DNA right here. And then if we could somehow connect these two together, we'd have a really simple system. And that's what they did. They created the tracer RNA, CRISPR RNA, Chimera. And so what's a Chimera? It's this ancient mythological beast that's a combination of all these different species. And so what they've done is created a new type of RNA. And they've got a system that's really simple. It's got two parts in it. You've got the Cas9 protein, and then you've got this Chimera. And since we're making this simpler, let's just call this the guide RNA. These are the two parts of a CRISPR-Cas9 system. This is going to be the CRISPR part. It's going to be the RNA that's got the information of where we want to cut. And then we've got the protein that's actually going to do the cutting. And this is what happens. And so if we've got a little bit of DNA, so this is the DNA that we want to cut, we create a guide RNA that's going to have a corresponding bit of RNA. What happens is the DNA will feed into it like that. Once it's in place, we're going to cut it right here, and we're going to cut it right here. And so we do this little snip, and now we have an inactivated gene. We've broken the gene. Now the cell will try to fix it. It'll do some insertions and deletions, creates mutations. 
But what we can do a lot of the time is we can inactivate that gene. That's what the bacteria are going to do. But since we've created it, we can cut the DNA wherever we want to cut the DNA. We essentially just have to know what is the sequence of DNA that we want to cut, put that into the guide RNA, and then we can cut it. Now let's say we want to make this more complex. Not only do we want to break a gene, but let's say we want to insert a new gene. Well, now the system's going to just have three parts. We've got the Cas9, we've got the guide RNA, and then we've got the host RNA that we want to put in. So as we break the DNA, the host DNA is going to be added, and then the DNA is going to fix it. So essentially, we've added the gene to the cell. Now, what's cool about the CRISPR-Cas9 system is it does this in living cells, and it can cut the DNA in multiple different places. So how can we use this? Well, let's say somebody has cystic fibrosis. What we can do is use a system like this to fix the genes in that person. Or in the future, we can engineer a new embryo. You can kind of see where this is going. But more importantly, I hope you know what a CRISPR system is. In review, a CRISPR system is an immune system that was identified in bacteria and then modified in humans. And I hope that was helpful. Set up the second one. I'll have Scott set up the second video that I think is valuable too. Some of this bears repeating. <laughs> All clear, right? Um, any any thoughts or questions or concerns while he's setting up the video? Yes. Um, what is the origin of viruses? The origin of viruses. Uh, let's see, what are you doing? Okay, yeah. <laughs> evolved from bacteria Yeah, I think it's it's a very simple structure of, like I said, just proteins uh, can, uh, with a, a protein uh, case around just some RNA. So it seems like one of the early ways that as life was struggling to develop on Earth that uh, Proteins and bacteria and another group called archaea were all uh, related in some regards, and there's some real hard uh, decisions and discussions going on that I'm not knowledgeable about that much as to which came first. They they have certain scientists that think that archaea were the initial um, life form that then bacteria and viruses came from. There's other people who think that viruses seem like the simplest thing to them, so. Uh, and even when they look through scientific uh, evolutionary data, it's hard to it's hard to see. It's kind of circular. The point can be made each way as to which was first or how they developed from each. So I don't know that they have it completely solved. Eric. So in a normal organism, it, all these um, all your uh, cells, uh, the, the DNA there, would be whether it, whether it's um, functional. With, with, with these with these guys with the CRISPR, it'll be yourself a bit of a, a chimera because there'll be some of them that are modified and some cells that are. In in a in a human, you're talking about not just yeah. the bacteria. Right, right. But once 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 you're made being made into a uh, you're, you're, with your your CRISPR um, uh, mages, there'll be surely an incomplete um, transformation. Right, and that's the challenging part that I think is uh, something that has to be talked about, and that's where a lot of the developments, I think, in CRISPR are going to occur. Most, most work in CRISPR right now is, is in the lab, right, where they're taking things, bacteria in a petri dish, or they're taking even human cells or cells from other uh, animals, and they're adapting and making one cell change, and they're seeing the, the value of that. Um, there have been, you heard about um, things going on in China maybe where somebody <clears throat> injected uh, cells into embryos of young girls growing up and they will have these changes throughout all their cells because those cells will reproduce and have that change in them. So any cell that's adapted <clears throat> by CRISPR has this as just another part of its genome. But Let's say that you're trying to do something about uh, uh, someone's liver. Chain Huntington's disease, I think, affects the liver and causes a whole bunch of uh, proteins to be made that are very deleterious to, to the body. Um, if you inject and you get, and you get 
this change and some of those liver cells are changed, you're not changing every liver cell all of a sudden, you know, it's not like, a, it's not like maybe a, a universal change in a word editing program that takes every cell in your body and, and changes it. But those cells that are changed will be producing the, the thing that retards that protein growth. And I think it was a, a determined that if you could change 1% of the cells in the liver, there would be enough going on that there would be enough protein in the body to retard it. So, um, I think that's a long way around your question. But basically, you aren't changing every cell unless you're changing the cell, right? And the one way you can change the cell is by changing the cell outside of the system and then um, injecting it into a body, into a human body, or an animal body, or wherever it goes, and then those cells reproduce. But I think the difference between that and what the Chinese researcher did and got in trouble for was that he actually changed the initial cell of, um, and of the fertilized egg, you know, fertilized egg and sperm, yeah. so that it was completely throughout the body because uh, that was the uh, generating mm -hmm. cell for the entire job. Right, right. There's a, go ahead. And he's now doing three years in jail for it. Yeah. Right, and he Some also, he's doing three years in jail, but there's also some pretty good indications that he was originally funded by the Chinese government too, so they can pick a they can pick a, uh, you know, a patsy, I guess, when they need to too for political reasons. This might be the same question, but when you make make one of these changes, the, this data is in every single cell in your body, right? Not necessarily. Only in the, only only in the cells body. that you've changed with the Cas. But no, I mean, don't you, how do you? The, the bad data is in all of your cells, and right. you want to change it. So how do you how do you do that? Now, for instance. I understand when a, a little girl is born, she already has uh, all of her eggs are all that she'll be passing on, right? right. And she, she's born with all of her eggs that she'll ever use. Right. So you, you have to get that information into those eggs, don't you, to, to get it to go into the next generation? There's That's the thing about it. I think that uh, that's where some of the, the, the worry gets. If you're going to pass along these changes to the next generation is a very... Uh, complex issue and what that really does. We don't know essentially what's going to happen. This may, this Cas9 CRISPR system may change something um, that you want to change, but it may have other effects that you have no idea what they are. 30 years from now, these people may have terrible outcomes of some nature sure. that we can't even predict. So, you know, uh, that's that's important to, to think about and and what it does if you change everything, not just in humans, but in any species, it can make, you know, super mosquitoes or something like that that we don't know about, too. And that's the major ethics question with the, the Chinese experiment, the fact that it was uh, the, the original cell, so that it's uh, complete and genetic hereditary model now. Are people hearing that in the back part? Mm -hmm. So she's saying that's the, that's the issue that's gone on uh, with the Chinese because they've changed um, the, the cell structure that's going to be passed on genetically. You can change cells in your in your body that aren't going to be passed on. They are only the cells in your sperm and egg, right, in your in your gene line that you pass on. Uh, and that has a whole variety of other questions I think are going to be worthwhile talking about and looking into and what that really means. If you change, if you take a 75 year old person who has a terrible disease and you do something you know you may not increase their quality of life that much but there's a lot to learn from that how it how it affects the production of these proteins in their system or whatever sure. but um, but it's not something that's going to change the gene line in a way that could be catastrophic it could be could be terrible potentially we don't know it, it, uh, it cries out for caution Mike is any of the human research? being done on human stem cell? Um, I think that there's some interesting, um, I don't know for sure that they are, I haven't heard of any that's, that's going on with it. Work on human stem cells. Scott, did you have a point you want to make? <clears throat> Talking about propagating changes to the next generation, that's one of the things that's happened a lot in the agriculture industry. And it probably goes way beyond the scope of your talk, but there's all kinds of legal implications that you could potentially patent a genome 
and there have been legal cases about you know genetically modified wheat that blows into another farmer's field, or maybe it was stolen, you know, the corn uh, seeds and whatnot. So, as long as you implant that genetic change in the germ cell in, in a reproductive cell, it will propagate subsequently on to the uh, additional species or yeah. additional offspring. That's the interesting thing. And what we've been talking about with some of these pictures uh, were, were interesting in terms of the fact that if you're, if you're changing bacteria, one cell bacteria, in whether it has a nucleus or not, that you're changing its genome. And when it splits into two uh, through mitosis, it's passing that on. So, so this system that bacteria do not only made themselves uh, able to combat viral infection better, but it also passed that tendency on to all its offspring from there too. Now there's a benefit to that and a, and, a, and a danger to that when you start talking about humans. But I was kind of interested, I wanted to see how quickly the questions got into humans, right? Because there's a lot about this, about plants that are maybe, uh, you know, remember the things I said keep in mind at the beginning of this talk, that, that can be done in ways that uh, increase a, a gene line in plants that is very beneficial, but still needs to be talked about. But we're getting into the human things, which is the complicated part, and I'm, I'm happy to go there. That's why I figured we probably have two times, talk, two sessions talking about this, because there's a lot to, to go on with it. But is there a question in the back? I just wondered, um, we were saying, uh, and as you say, we've got into humans, when you inject a new cell with new DNA, What's the rate, do you know what the rate of cell death and replenishment is? I think I heard something recently that, but she asked what's the rate of cell replenishment in a, in a human body? And I thought I heard that within uh, seven years or something, almost all of the cells in your body are not, are not alive anymore. They're replaced and replenished. Uh, I think it's about seven years, um, and and but somehow we have memories from when we were you know, four years old, but none of the cells that remember that were there when we were four years old. So it's it's an interesting topic in science. Yes. I had heard the seven year thing about your skin, which is constantly renewing, but your heart cells are there for good. I don't think they change, grow, and change uh, very quickly. Yeah, I think, yeah. So, I mean, it depends on what part of your body. Okay. Because, you know, all of your, the cells from all of your organs are specialized to be just that organ. You don't want liver cells growing in your brain, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. I think they're all programmed to change over at different rates depending on the needs of that organ. She's saying they change over at different rates based on the need of the organ, and I would, I would definitely agree with that. That's most likely true. John? A couple of weeks ago, there was, I, I um, cut part of it on CPM, and they had a, a doctor talk about that. It is. Uh, but you, you were talking about stem cells. And it, apparently now, they can take the, the skin cell and modify it in these techniques, turn it into a stem cell, any kind of stem cell they want. So they can even create old organisms that are extinct. Uh, they also talked about uh, making modifications to the human cell so that the viruses don't recognize it as one of those and they just don't it. Right, he, he, was, he was saying that uh, stem cells, remember we had 10, 12 years ago, there was a lot of controversy about stem cells, what you're doing with you know, young embryos of young unborn people, un unborn people or unborn uh, embryos it's called. Um, and what, what were the ethics behind all that? And stem cells have great capacity to reproduce other parts of your body, can be a very beneficial um, medical procedure. And then it was determined that there were ways you didn't have to go to embryos to get stem cells. You could make stem cells out of almost any cell in the body, which, uh, which then takes maybe some of the ethics away of, of working with unborn. Um, but yeah, so, so that's, again, a challenge in ways of what, what's going on and how this is done. You know, I don't think people see an ethics problem, let's say, of, of converting uh, a potato to, to, to last longer or whatever. 
For example, nowadays when they're trying to find, when scientists or, or food scientists are trying to develop ways to make a better barley corn, or a barley product, let's say, one major way of doing it is to, uh, to bombard a variety of different barley with radiation. So they take, let's say, 10,000 barley uh, uh, kernels and, in, and hit them with radiation of different amounts and different times and everything like that, keep it all, and then start growing them. And you have all these mutations caused by the bombardment of these barley uh, seeds with, with radiation, and then some grow, and some show this capacity, which takes a while to develop. Some show a capacity that somehow this odd mutation caused them to um, uh, be resistant to a fungus, or some were terrible and the barley seed never grew. So it's just kind of a scatter shot, shotgun approach, and they find something that worked, and they, they mutate these cells by that technique. So it's, it's not a very scientific method in one sense, um, but CRISPR could actually find what causes this fungus to grow on this barley and inject a new change in that DNA to either deactivate that gene or to do some do some good in that sense. So, you know, there's there's more level of science awareness, let's say, or, or more surgical science than than there is just to bombard things with radiation and see what the results are. Jamie? Uh, unfortunately the agricultural area of GMO is not pre of ethical issues either. Um, there's some evidence that GMO corn pollen is is hopping species and turning um, weed species into um, completely resistant to things like uh, Roundup. So that it's spreading the gene, mod uh, the modified gene, into species that are not the corn. Right. And you know that's still a question of okay, what does it do then to you know, surrounding surrounding fields, surrounding forests? Whatever. That's just the wild, crazy, impetuous wheat that's doing that. Mm -hmm. um, stable, <laughs> calm wheat doesn't do that. Actually, I think it's the corn that's the biggest you're on wheat. Because of the, the dis I know, there's that wheat too. She's saying that there's cross-pollination from different species even, from wheat to corn, or corn to wheat, and so on. And, and, uh, and more importantly, like corn to what is truly a weed or a basic crop that's maybe an alien species to this country and or to wherever it's being grown so that things that should be being killed and eliminated are not being killed and eliminated. We just need more powerful types of roundup, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, here. Well, this is a simple question with probably a complex answer, but a friend of mine, uh, his, he has a grandson with cystic fibrosis. Right, basically what they do now is they kind of treat symptoms and they're making some progress. But they would use this technique to cure his genes. Would his children inherit his CF or not? I, I'm not an expert on you know the details of how you inherit <clears throat> cystic fibrosis and how it goes. Um, the question would be if you change the germline, which the sperms and the cells in that child, um, and I would say that there's a variety of ways to cure this disease. One is to just change it in the structure that needs it to be changed in. Um, and I'm not sure what it is in cystic fibrosis, where you have to address it and what you have to do. There's an interesting story about a, a woman. There's a disease that affects only something like 20 or 40 people worldwide. And it's a uh, it's caused by the human pap papillom papilloma papilloma, yeah. papilloma virus, and uh, it's naturally occurring, but only in about 20 people or so worldwide. And this woman had it. She's she's about 64 right now, and they keep pretty good tabs on these people because they're so um, uh, there's so few of them, and it's a disease that causes warts and skin problem and you're hospitalized numerous times during your life with terrible skin problems and, and it affects your organs and so on and they lost touch of this woman which they didn't like doing but then she represented herself and she brought her two daughters who were at the time in her 20s or so 
and they both had this same condition. So it was obviously genetically passed on condition. But she reported that she had never had this, uh, she had never had a repeat incident. Her warts cleared up, all this stuff cleared up, and she had no problems with this anymore. She just felt like she grew out of it. You know, I grew out of this disease, and they don't know why. They took swabs of her cheek and, and saliva samples, and she still had, they know with sequencing, they know exactly where the problem was in her gene structure. She still had the genetic code in, her, in, her, in these swabs that showed that her body still had the improper gene genetic code. She should have this disease. So they went a little bit further, and they took blood samples. The blood did not have this code in it. The blood that was traveling through her body didn't have the genetic impropriety problem. So they're just wondering about this. How does this happen? How did the different cells in your body get different things? And in fact, further investigation of her, of her blood showed that the chromosome that had this problem had had a massive uh, attack or problem with it. And, and almost half of that chromosome had been destroyed. And part of what was destroyed was this bad part of her genome. So by luck, this, this event that they never know when it happened or why or how or whatever did that. And not only did that happen on this one cell that was in her body, but like the question we've been asking about, it happened to also be on a very important cell, a cell that reproduces and makes more of her blood cells. So, so that cell that had this gigantic change to it produced a whole array of blood cells that went through her body and her blood cells no longer had this disease. And the blood cells were what was causing the disease, this papillomavirus. So she had like two amazingly fortuitous events, right? One was that one of her cells was, was corrupted by some major event that knocked off this bad genome. And second, it was on a cell that then produces and populates the rest of her blood. So she didn't have this issue anymore. She didn't have this problem anymore. So I, I, I bring that up because I think it addresses maybe some of the questions and thoughts we have about this and ways we're, we're, we're looking about it. But um, that was a natural gene editing or unnatural, but it was her body going through a process that changed her genome where it mattered that saved her life, made her a much better quality of life. So that's a natural gene editing, and scientists are finding ways to replicate that and not do it with this big bludgeon that took off half her chromosome. Mm -hmm. By luck, it, was, it didn't do anything else that was critical to supporting her life, right? She was, usually something like that would be of such a nature that, <coughs> that you know, she died. Could have been an X-ray explosion, exposure, or something like that. It was yeah, it was. It was impossible to tell because it was just one cell getting changed. It could have been, you know, getting zapped by being out in the sunlight or something like that. Nancy, um, I wanted to go back for a second um, because I am curious about the um, the use of the gene editing in, in humans. Um, there was a 60-minute segment on uh, CRISPR and gene editing um, for sickle cell anemia which has been very highly successful and acclaimed and everybody is saying this is absolutely fantastic. Successful mainly in most parts in the laboratory with human cells taken and changing it in the petri dish and things like that. Then of, I think a few incidents of doing it in, in, uh, on actual humans. Yes, they have about 12, 15 people that they have now reinserted it, done it, working well, beautiful. And, and they're very excited about that. But then you have this doctor who tried to do, make a resistance to HIV, is my understanding that the Chinese doctor wanted to do. And he's in jail for that. And is the reason why he's in jail and the 60 minute um, people that were working with sickle cell are being widely acclaimed is because the Chinese um, inserted in an area where it will be replicated uh, by not only all the uh, cells in that person's body, but future generations as well? That's the real question. If you take, like I was saying, a, a 
50, 60, 70 year old person and give them something, some gene editing that causes something to occur and they aren't passing on this trait to any other future offspring, that's one thing and maybe science learns some things. That could be a step that could be acceptable. The uh, people, Jennifer Doudna, who, um, who developed this CRISPR technique out in California, Berkeley, um, she called actually for um, a, a, a um, compendium, a group to get together and to try to discuss and address this, similar to how things were addressed maybe about uh, nuclear uh, capacities, you know, what we can do about bomb making, things like that too. So basically, yes, if you're, it, it, it seems like right now with what we know, because we don't know what the outcomes will be, if you give it to 30, 40, 50, 60 year old people, and well, let's knock the 30 year olds out for a second, but people that aren't going to reproduce anymore, uh, and you do it in an area that isn't injecting into their um, their cell line, you could do it with a seven year old and change change things in their liver, let's say, but not change their, their um, uh, sperm and rectum genome. And that would be more ethical right now, at least, than than um, changing the sperm line. Uh -huh. I just wanted to go, go back to the overall ethics, ethical question, and that is, I think when your title of your talk, the last word is scary. To me, the scary part is we have a lot of evolving to do as humans to really be ethical and know that everything affects everybody in the world, in the universe. And, and it's ethical if the ethical involvement isn't there with these discoveries and these putting them into practice, that's the scary part. Because it, it can't be about how much money is it going to make or you know how much notoriety is the person going to get. I mean, that to me is the thing that that we're we're way behind on that involvement involvement morally. Our ethic, our ethic and moral gene isn't developed yet. You're saying you could right. use some more exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, I mean, that's, that's a point I, I want to bring up maybe in the second topic of what it, what it really means. I think it's valuable and important. In fact, Jennifer Doudna, who's written a great book, A Crack in Creation, um, and, uh, and, and her group are asking for this talk to go on, to get to this point of really understanding what it means. When, when I mean, we've seen what happens when people that have a lot of money do things to get their kids into the colleges that they want, right? They, that's important to them, and they're doing it out of love or whatever, right? But their ethics are something that many of us would question. Whereas now, if you can make, you know, a six foot four blonde, you know, person, um, that's, and you know, who's going to take over the capacities that CRISPR gives us, right? Is it going to be used to stop terrible diseases that that hurt often poor people? Or is it going to be used so people can have a designer animal with wings or something like that that they want, right? I have my own unicorn because I got $60 million to throw into somebody to do it too. So that's, that's the interesting points. Um, we'll take one more question and we're running out of time like we usually do. So, so thanks so much. Do you have one here? So I may have this earlier, but in some of the bacterial genomes, the CRISPR genomes, Right. What he's saying is that uh, in back to just the bacterial viral thing that started this all off, in the bacterial DNA, whatever's in the bacterial DNA will be passed along. And it's the CRISPR area, they say, is one of the most quickly evolving areas in the DNA of a bacteria because any viral influence in there, when it takes a little snippet and adds it in, that gets passed on to its offspring. So, so that's a, uh, a value not only to that bacteria, but it's all its daughter cells that come out of it too. But yeah, that, that is built up and it's a building, building, building um, part of, the, of their chromosomal structure. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, a good topic, and uh, any questions or thoughts? Thank you.